Great. So thank you very much, um, Kate, for that introduction. And hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be able to talk to you about this project, uh, which is looking at coastal resilience to um, flood and erosion hazard. And as I say, the sort of the affiliation is mainly to the University of Southampton, because that's where most of the, the work was done before I, before I joined the University of East Anglia. And just to give some sort of background then, this was a sort of a, originally a one year project um, as, a, as part of this program. Um, although actually we've had a no cost extension, the project formally ends in uh, at the end of October um, uh, this, this month, because um, we've had a nine month uh, no cost extension. And the goal really was to look at how can we assess realistic pathways for, for strategic coastal erosion and flood resilience in the light of climate change, including sea level rise in the sort of UK context. That was our overall goal. And I think it's important to recognize the SMP2 refresh, which was going on in parallel um, with, this, uh, with this project. Uh, and many of you listening will be aware of that. Uh, and we had, had the number of workshops where I think that was discussed quite intensively, but our project is going well beyond the SMP2 refresh. I think that's important to distinguish it from it. In terms of the team that did the work, um, there was a lot of people at Southampton, um, people with uh, backgrounds in engineering, uh, natural sciences, social sciences, and also sort of informatics and data uh, were working on this project. And then we also had John French from UCL uh, and Edmund Penning Rousel from Flat Hazard Research Center in Middlesex University and Charlie Thompson from Channel Coastal Observatory was also involved. And then we had a number of other, um, a number of partners. I think the Coastal Group Network were particularly important, I think, in getting, uh, in helping us connect with a wide range of stakeholders, but all the partners listed there uh, were, were, were involved and, and others at our number of workshops that we actually held. And um, when we go to um, the, uh, so the starting, I, I was asked to speak about um, adaptation to um, flooding um, and can we adapt to three degrees of flooding a, a couple of weeks ago at a meeting that's all organized under this project and the Climate Change Committee and others. And I was thinking about how flooding, flood adaptation has evolved going back to 1953. And it's clearly we've had a big transformation over that sort of 70 year time span as we've moved towards a sort of risk based flood and erosion management that we all take for granted in a way now. But of course, that's something that's really developed quite significantly over the last few decades. And I think it's important that transformation is ongoing. And so, you know, and, and now there's this interest in resilience. And and so we're asking the question, building on this foundation. So we want to acknowledge the foundation, the great foundation that we have. How can we operationalize resilience for coastal erosion and flood hazard management? That's the kind of core question that we're asking here. And we recognize that resilience is widely seen as an important attribute of coastal systems. And we see it a lot. It's used widely in policy documents over the last 10 years. But then when we think about what do we mean by resilience and how do we operationalize resilience? That's rather more uh, limited. And also there's the, the, the kind of the idea is what, what actually do we mean by resilience? The word is used, but what definition are we actually following? So what we're aiming to do here is just, what we've done is to show how resilience could be measured and applied within policy processes, building on what we've been doing building on existing policies, and we demonstrate that with our coastal resilience model using England as a case study. And I think the key point, though, to take home from this is the key insights here can say concern the process. Um, we see this as a demonstration of what needs to be done if you want to quantify, measure and apply resilience. Uh, and so the, our insight is about the process, and we see this as something that's a prototype that would need a lot more development um, to be applied uh, in practice. So that's an important point to note. When we look at resilience language um, in policy documents, um, as shown here, um, and this work done by Emma Tompkins at Southampton, it lists a number of documents 
that mention the word resilience and been produced by DEFRA, etc., over the last 10 years. And it actually identifies in the third column, how often does the word resilience or resilient or whatever appear in those documents? And you can see in sometimes it's, you know, it's hundreds of times um, in the documents. And the last column is saying yes or no, is resilience defined? And it's, it's apparent that in many cases, particularly in the past, um, maybe more so, not so much now, but resilience wasn't actually defined. So bringing home the point about what do we actually mean by the word resilience and, and, and the importance of actually um, defining it. And Linkov um, here produced this diagram in Nature Climate Change. Linkov works for the US Army Corps of Engineers in the United States, who've really embraced the notion of resilience. And I think resilience is a broader concept than risk, and it sort of maybe embraces the concept of risk in that we're talking about um, going along some kind of shock which we can absorb and then and our ability to recover from that and then subsequently adapt and maybe even improve upon the sort of dotted line going forward in time. And Rosati also works for the US Army Corps of Engineers and uh, uh, defines resilience as the ability of a system to prepare, resist, recover and adapt to disturbances in order to achieve successful functioning through time. And that is the definition of resilience that we have adopted um, in our work. So that's our kind of core definition of resilience. But it brings out the point about context is important. It's essential that conceptually you define um, what resilience against what and resilience for whom. And then when you move to operationalize resilience, I think then you actually see with the US Army Corps of Engineers, their operationalization of this concept is very much linked to sort of disaster risk management and really response to hurricane landfall, I would say, is, is kind of one of the core kind of issues that they're addressing. And of course, it's the issue that the United States has to deal with a lot. So resilience in a UK context is almost certainly going to be different. And Spike make this point that as you move around the world's coasts, resilience in any place would need to take on the local context to make it meaningful. So when we want to, and we want to think about it, how do we enhance resilience? So every system has an ability to bounce back and how can we actually enhance that? And so when we think about coastal systems, we're thinking about what they encompass. So the, it's a systemic view. And we're thinking about landforms and ecosystems, and those very naturally lend themselves to lots of ideas in the literature on resilience from, e from ecologists and um, geomorphologists. But we also need to take account of other key parts of the coastal system. So the socioeconomic systems, and in the UK context, we have large engineered infrastructural systems. We also have to think about those as well. So we want to think about all the aspects of the coast. And then if we're thinking about flooding and erosion, we have to recognize that they have different footprints. And so we need to try, you know, so uh, erosion is, is more spatially limited at the coast. Flooding can extend over larger areas and an area can be flooded many times. You can only really erode an area once. So the kind of characteristics of these two hazards is different as well. And so therefore we have this issue that we need to think about uh, describing uh, different things in different ways. And, we, and you as you start to unpick resilience, you have different sort of perspectives, different metrics. And there's an important point to note that we have apples, oranges, maybe in pairs when we're thinking about resilience and that we need to bring all this together as we, as we develop our understanding. And then if we want to enhance the resilience of these systems, we're talking about a transition from the present um, largely qualitative notion to some quantitative evidence-based framework. We need to measure it so we can actually assess what, what are the trends in resilience? Is it constant going up or going down? And we recognize also that we don't need to have a complete system description in an absolute sense. That's very challenging, but we do need to understand the actions that will enhance or reduce the state of resilience. Um, and for this, we, we need, you need to define a set of objectives which really encapsulate the actions that will actually either maximize the capacity to cope 
or minimize the potential for loss. And this next picture here looks at the objectives to enhance resilience, um, you know, either say by maximizing capacity to cope or minimizing the, pot the potential uh, d damages. And you can see here a number of different uh, objectives that we're, we're sort of following with our methods. So we want to maximize community preparedness or um, minimize injury loss of health, life and health impacts, etc. And going on down here, I won't read them all out to you, but that this is the idea. And then if we want to build on this and develop a decision making framework, we have to sort of think about developing a policy or decision making framework that has a clarity of purpose. It identifies the options that are available to achieve to achieve this. And then we have to have performance measures. How do we actually understand whether or not we're achieving what we want to, what we want to achieve? So I think the steps, and there's sort of four really steps here. We have to establish the decision-making context, our policy aims, looking at decision-makers, key stakeholders. What are the objectives? And they need to be sort of smart objectives, specific, measurable, agreed, realistic, and time-dependent. We need to define what options can realistically address the objectives. And then we need to design a method that can evaluate likely outcomes and measure the performance. So those are the sort of four steps that we want to go through here. So looking at the decision-making framework, what are our objectives? And so looking at the sort of high level agendas here, coming sort of from policy, we can look at around issues around human health, and well-being, assets, residual risk, etc. And we can then define a set of resilience objectives. So we want to maximize, um, say, human health. And then how do we actually achieve that? Well, we can think about minimizing loss of life, minimizing injury, and minimizing sort of health impacts, just to sort of look at the top line there. And all the way, so, so we can actually go from these high-level agendas into specific things that we can think about how we can achieve and think about how we can actually uh, measure them. And then how do we, achieve, then we, we can think about, well, what are the different strategic policy options that we have to implement or to actually influence uh, resilience? And we can look at what is going on in the UK today. And here are four, or sorry, three different um, uh, lists, the SMP policy options, which are well known, then the adaptation options as defined by DEFRA in 2008, and the resilience tools defined by the EA in 2009. And so, so these sort of provide sort of existing uh, policy recommendations on the kinds of things um, that we, we can be doing. And what we did within Coast Rares is we actually developed this um, list uh, in the fourth column, which uh, really is a sort of synthesis of these three uh, earlier published lists about the policies that we might actually implement to uh, enhance resilience. So in terms of what we're thinking about uh, in the rest of the talk, this, um, uh, this column here is really essentially the measures. So land use planning, catchment management planning, coast protection, uh, et cetera. Those are the options, but they can map back onto options and policies that, that already exist. When we think about the workflow that we might actually use to, um, to, to, to uh, look at uh, um, erosion and, and flood resilience, um, we, we recognize that this is the kind of workflow that we need to consider. And we, I mentioned the idea of apples, oranges and pears, that we have different things here. And that we need to, to really bring those together, we need to be thinking about using multi-criteria analysis, which is well used in government for these kinds of problems where you have um, different, different, uh, different things that you're trying to evaluate, which have different sort of units or currencies um, to bring them all together. And the first step really, I think, is that on the left there is this idea of system conceptualization. What are the kind of critical functionalities in the coastal system? And this notion of sort of scenarios of hazards and sort of socioeconomics and policies. Then we move on to resilience measures. How can we actually measure these things? And we need to think about scoring and weighting. And finally, our resilience model, where we look at the current state 
of resilience, and we can think about how that might change with time um, and, with po and, and with different policies over time. And the green arrows are sort of making the point about we have to bring, if we're going to be using multi-criteria analysis and we're going to be doing sort of weighting, we've got to see what people care about. There has to be, there's no absolute uh, understanding of resilience. It's going to be something that's socially constructed. And so we need to take on board stakeholder perceptions and priorities. Uh, and, and in the project, we actually used, we, 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 we actually um, surveyed ourselves um, to, to actually come up with some sort of prototype stakeholder perceptions and priorities, but that clearly would need a lot more work um, to operationalize this in practice. And also we needed to bring in data sets to be able to ev evaluate the resilience model. Once we had the measures, we had to evaluate them, we had to get to data sets. And so we move on here to different objectives that we actually, um, to operationalize it. To, um, and here we have uh, our coastal resilience measures, mainly a lot, a lot around people, then some around property and some around nature. And so going through, we have different, again, this it, is quite a, quite a lot on this slide, but we have different things that we're maximizing or, or minimizing. And then we're in blue, we have performance measures and in sort of the reddish color, we have surrogate measures. And then we needed to go on and look at um, the data sets that were available and find ways of getting sort of indicators of all these different parameters that are going in to our coastal resilience model. And to kind of capture the flow here then, so we have our sort of metrics, our native units, you know, be it people, be it property, be it nature, so numbers of people, maybe value of property, area of salt marsh might be the sort of units that we might have in, our, in, in that first box. Then we need to score those metrics onto a kind of common, onto a common frame um, and, and, and actually look at how those, how those, um, how those, uh, that those metrics might vary as well. And then we move on to the stakeholder weighting and the relative importance that we apply though to those different me metrics. And ultimately then we can move down and we can actually think about producing a map, a view of you know, what is the state of resilience today. And then we can think about how things might change with time. And we can actually look at how resilience therefore might evolve. And therefore um, we have the, how we, if we apply different policies, how things might change um, with time and we might enhance resilience, which is our goal. To look at that, we, uh, we, look, we did a number of case studies of, of, of smaller regions. So we looked at, here we are, Portsmouth and the Outer Humber, so an, a city and a rural area. And we're going to mainly look at Portsmouth here. So you can see the sort of polygons. These are showing the floodplains um, from the uh, sort of Environment Agency sort of indicative maps that sort of define the areas that we're looking at. Um, and you can look here in terms of building up a resilience index um, we have these different things that we're measuring and if you look at this you can see a combined resilience score which is the dark blue you can see a resilience score that's taken if you take an economic perspective so we had different stakeholder views so we, we looked at what happens if you stress an economic view you, the, the yellow is if you stress an environmental view and the sort of uh, orangey brown is a social pers preference perspective and so you can see that these that you get different answers depending on the weightings that emerge and for example with human health um, human health is contributing more so again you can see it's contributing 10 with uh, under a social preference so it's contributing more to the social uh, perspective of resilience than it is to the combined uh, economic or environmental, for example. So the, weight, the, the weighting has a big effect on what is contributing uh, to the resilience. And so that's maybe the main point to take out of this slide. We can also, again, this is for Portsmouth, we again looked at a sort of illustrative adaptation options. We, we looked at over time, this is an arbitrary over 50 years, um, looking at the, look, taking the combined, the economic, the environmental and the social uh, um, uh, uh, resilience. And with, we imagined one scenario where maybe the defense standard falls with time due to sea level rise and residual risk 
um, is falling. And those are the, that's P1, those are the solid lines. And actually there you see that the uh, resilience over time is falling um, in um, all uh, cases. Um, while with P2, we imagined a well, well rehearsed emergency plan is developed, public awareness grows with time, flood proofing increases with time. Um, and these are, these, are, these are progressive rather than something you've done in a step. Um, and so therefore you see that the resilience is having a more positive trajectory, um, uh, but, but not so much the economic um, resilience, it's only so certain components of resilience are, are, are not responding to this. So you can see how things are changing with time. And then we can zoom in and just look at maps of resilience scores for each one of the areas that we're looking at. So the uh, sort of red is the lowest um, resilience um, going up and sort of the sort of greens um, uh, are, are, are sort of higher resilience. And you can see for the combined environmental, economic and social perspectives. So the overall resilience actually for Portsmouth and the Outer Humber are quite similar, but they come from different areas. So you can see from the environmental resilience of the Outer Humber is higher than Portsmouth. Um, but the economic and social resilience are lower. And these really are just illustrative of the outcomes of the method. We also, can, we also did a national assessment of resilience to demonstrate the method. And so this is the resilience index, the combined resilience index for the, uh, all of England. And what we've done is about 8,000 different spatial units were analysed around the UK, around England, sorry. And then they were all mapped onto 90 square kilometre hexagons uh, and, the, and, and, and the mean was taken um, from these. And then the distribution of the, the count is sort of shown in the histogram. So you can sort of see there's a sort of a distribution there with um, going up from a sort of score of 45 to a score um, of 80. And then the spatial sort of the spatial pattern that's produced. So, but again, the key and London isn't actually included in this. So we, we I mean, London could be included, I suppose, in the coastal resilience map, but we, we didn't include London um, because of reasons of sort of, uh, of sort of data availability. Um, but this is illustrative of the fact that we can produce this map. I think we, the key point here, as I'm stressing, is that we've produced a method that allows us to quantify and assess resilience. Uh, and we think this is the kind of approach that needs to be taken if you want to do this. And th th this is the kind of process that needs to be done to achieve this. And um, we're, we think the method is the main insight and we need to take this forward if we're going to operationalize this. And for example, I said the stakeholder views here are based on the people in the project that clearly needs to be developed a, a lot more. And, and there are other conceptual models of resilience that could, that could be presented as well. But so we've, the summary then, we've developed a model that quantifies resilience to support the overarching goal of enhancing coastal resilience to flooding and erosion. The economic and environmental and social dimensions of resilience are quantified using open access geospatial data sets in conjunction with multiple criteria analysis. Subjective MCA weightings are used constructively to express stakeholder perspectives. This is fundamental to the approach. If you're going to um, look at resilience in a quantitative sense, you've got to take account of stakeholder views. What do people want? Um, today and how might that and that might change with time as well it certainly has changed with over time in the past um, I think our analysis expands the current risk-based shoreline management planning to a broader perspective that takes account of much more account of, I think of coastal community characteristics and priorities but it's taking account of them in ways that are consistent with current government priorities um, Given if we can develop scenarios of the hazards and socioeconomic scenarios, we can actually look at how these resilience um, values would change with time. So we can actually understand if what we could achieve with different policies. I think there is a caveat here that we note we noted that if we really wanted to start to integrate resilience based management challenges, we're actually crossing different boundaries of government here. You know, that although we all these are all different government policies, they're actually done by different parts of government at the moment and we're bringing them together so that's an interesting um, thought there about um, what what that would mean for governance arrangements in terms of thinking about 
um, economic regeneration really as part of this. It's moving much more beyond coastal engineering, maybe, which where shoreline management planning sort of started. But I think that this approach can certainly provide a robust and evidence-based framework for delivering um, you know, sustainable, equitable, and socially acceptable adaptive responses to climate change at the coast. And it can really shed, I think, important insights. And I think the, in the project, the process of trying to understand, measure, and, and um, interpret resilience has made, um, has really caused us to change our thinking about resilience. And I think the process, if we did this nationally, there would clearly be a lot of learning um, about resilience as, as, as a sort of, both in this sort of uh, coastal management community, but I think in society, and I think it would really encourage a common framework for having evidence-based decisions about these important issues. In terms of um, what we've, the evidence we've produced here, we've got uh, operationalized, we've got a paper that describes this, it's in review. We have a website on the Channel Coastal Observatory uh, and all this material will be put there and as material becomes available, hopefully I'll be able to use this list to actually inform you about this. But there is the link that exists today. And um, as an acknowledgement, I think the acknowledgements are all pretty clear. I'd like to, East Coast Solar Coastal Partnership and Scarborough District Council were very helpful with our regional workshops. And Susan Hansen helped prepare the figures and helped generally help get all this stuff together. So with that, I think then uh, Charlie Thompson will actually then um, uh, offer her perspectives on, on on this work and how it might go forward.